this now brings me uh, to the last but not least um, speaker, Professor Yuka Yokileto. I feel very privileged and very humbled to introduce you. Um, I don't think there are many more other experts in the field of urban conservation and urban planning uh, who have worked on the World Heritage Sites than Professor Yoki Leto. Um, he will be talking today about urban conservation from Persepolis to Isfahan, reflections on territorial management of Iranian cultural health heritage. Please welcome Professor Yoki Leto. Good afternoon. I think that actually I should stop here now because it's now 16 hours and we should have our coffee. Anyway, I decided to take this portable microphone because I don't want to hide behind this pulpit. Um, my message is relatively simple. I'm going to talk about the context, not about the monuments themselves. And, uh, but I'm also trying to link it with the UNESCO World Heritage Convention and also the evolution of the policies related to this convention. To start with, I would like to remember, everybody knows that Persia or Iran is a strategic position in the between the different continents. Uh, so it is in some way a crossroads of civilizations. It's also interesting to notice that we have these three first World Heritage inscriptions in 1979. Then it took many years until we have the next one, which is Dr. Suleiman and other 13, so we have now today 17 World Heritage Sites. Last one was Shahr in 2014. So about one, one site per year. Actually, um, I've been a bit involved almost with every, everybody of this, but I'm not going to talk about myself. Um, anyway, I also wanted to say that the UNESCO Convention was adopted because uh, there was a very important deterioration of cultural heritage. And I think we have now seen lots of examples of that. And it was considered that the protection of this heritage at the national level often remains incomplete due to the scale of resources which are required and so on, insufficient economic, scientific, technological resources and so on. Therefore, this World Heritage Convention was supposed to provide an additional help to the national states uh, in this task. And of course, now we have more than a thousand World Heritage Sites on this UNESCO list. Uh, the World Heritage Convention was adopted in 1972 and there is a whole story about this adoption uh, where the first uh, but it took several years until um, a number of states sufficient for the, um, shall we say, the material opening of this uh, s system became a reality. And so in 1976, the first 25 states were represented in Nairobi in the first General Assembly. In 1977, we have the first World Heritage Session in Paris. And the chairman was Mr. Firuz Bagersadeh from Iran, who was then Director General of Iranian Center of Archaeological Research. The other vice chairmen were Egypt, France, Nigeria, Poland, and the rapporteur was Canadian. In 2014, we have now 191 states parties, which is almost the same number as what UNESCO states, UNESCO member states are. Um, Iran ratified this convention in 1975 and uh, the World Heritage List has now 1,007 properties, which 
mo most of these are actually cultural heritage properties. So the idea of the World Heritage Committee was to, to make the declaration that the World Heritage List should be exclusive. Only the best are the best. And there was also a recognition given to the so-called progressive authenticity. It means that not only the original stru structure, but also the later significant contributions to the evolution of each monument should be taken into account in this. Uh, I would also, the operational guidelines def define how this World Heritage Convention should be interpreted in different practical situations. And, and um, one of the issues is to, that they have defined the criteria for inscription. They were first defined in 1977 in the first World Heritage Committee session. Uh, but it's also interesting to see that if you look at them carefully, you will notice that they have still six cultural criteria and four natural heritage criteria. But there has been an evolution so today, these, heritage, these criteria ref are different from what they were in 1970. So it's not a static issue, but it is an evolution. And this evolution actually is based on the evolving concepts of cultural heritage in general. I'm talking also about cultural heritage, not natural heritage. Uh, the outstanding universal value um, was thought at the beginning to, it has now been defined also in the operational guidelines, saying that we are talking about something which is so exceptional as to transcend the national boundaries and to be of common importance for present and future generations of all humanity. That is the statement. It's very difficult to actually translate and to practical guidelines. Take, for example, China or Guatemala or uh, I don't know, whatever you have, Vatican City. It's very difficult to start talking about national boundaries. I think we need to have some other type of criteria uh, into that. Anyway, more recently, in 1998, there, is a, there was a meeting in Amsterdam, and it was said that the OUV should be identified as an outstanding response to issues of universal nature common to or addressed by all human cultures, which means that we are actually looking at the cultural basis as the reference for defining the World Heritage culture, uh, uh, Outstanding Universal Value. Uh, there are two aspects which are very important. One is the protection and one is the management system. Uh, you have to have protection for the nominated site but you also have to be able to manage the site properly. Uh, and uh, especially the management system has been subject to a lot of discussion over these past 40 years. Uh, it is not a simple issue and it's not a strict issue, um, but means that uh, an effective management system depends on the type, characteristics, and needs of the nominated property and its context. And the management systems may vary according to different cultural perspectives and resources available and other factors. Uh, just to make a simple schematic drawing, we can look at the several levels of significance and protection and management. We can say that internationally we may recognize uh, like this heritage of outstanding universal value. And that, of course, is the main attention of the World Heritage Convention. However, uh, it must have a context. That context should also be protected because otherwise the problems come from the outside. And now it has been also uh, understood that the management should even actually cover a much wider uh, territory because, in fact, I am an architect and urban planner and I remember even in the 1960s when I was exercising this type of profession, um, it was very clear that the 
many, uh, the sort of territorial planning, uh, they, it had to take into account all the forces of development in this area. You cannot imagine that you will protect a site in isolation if you don't can't understand what is happening around it. Uh, and so we have come in 1992, also in the World Heritage context, to the concept of cultural landscape. So cultural landscapes have been considered um, as specified parts of the territory, uh, associated with significant creative, symbolic or direct human interaction that endures over time. Elements or issues in cultural landscape when associated with particular meaning can be interpreted as signs that have a sense as a creative response in reference to particular types of activities or processes responding to human needs in a specific context. This is a bit my text, uh, but it means that we have to identify what is significant in relation to the theme that we understand has also a universal significance. Uh, the question of integrity can then come out of this examination. We can say that in reference to the notion of integrity, in a specified case, such signs, which are signs of a particular activity in a certain area, uh, refer to the social, symbolic or functional integrity that defines the part of territory concerned. Uh, this is also outside the world, heri uh, the world, outside world heritage area. The question of authenticity is another aspect which must be taken into account. In reference to the no inauthenticity, the recognized signs become the sources of information for the authentication of the truthfulness and the credibility of this, of this place. So there is a whole sort of uh, academic or research project which we have been discussing also today quite a long time. And of course, uh, when we look at then some of these sites, now Chokazambil was one of the three sites to be inscribed at the beginning. Um, it was interesting, and I understand uh, from my <laughs> friend, Dr. Adel, that, that at that time we were in a hurry. Uh, it was difficult to get suddenly some documentary evidence. This is the only plan that was included in the nomination document. Uh, and there was just a few pages of saying that this is so important, we must put it on the World Heritage List, and it was put on the World Heritage List. Of course, now we have a much better plan, and of course, um, which reflects then the ideas. It's interesting here now in Sogazambil, um, in, um, between the Iran-Iraq war, it was a war zone in military occupation and so on. Then gradually it has been liberated from this military occupation and has become subject to quite major conservation projects uh, in collaboration with various, various, uh, various um, organizations, including the UNESCO fund, Japan Funds in Trust project and also with ICRAM. Um, so in these past 20 years, more or less, there has been now established a management plan, a system of organization and so on. And so it is sort of relatively well placed in this issue. Of course, still we can notice that the principal factors impact in deterioration on the site relate to the environmental condition, rainy climate in relation to mud brick, and the extension and development of sugarcane industries in the region, air and water pollution have increased considerably in the past years, which of course does contribute to this issue. Um, but on the other hand, it is it has not so much urban development or this sort of building development outside, so it is relatively well protected, I would say now. Uh, when we go to Persepolis, as we have heard already, so I'm a little bit like repeating what has been already said, um, in also in this case, we had the main attention was on this terrace, the royal terrace, and this plan was actually included in the, in the nomination document. Um, 
But now we have also understood that it was not the only important monument. We have also other monuments which include um, the tombs and the sacred mountain and so on, plus many other things. So it, it is a sort of like issue, not necessarily so much that you have to put everything on the World Heritage List, but rather that we are aware of this context and that we take note that of that in the management and planning systems so that we are not losing these connections. In 2003, the periodic report, Ozzy Ozer also mentioned it already, talked about the status of the site boundaries, which should be, uh, uh, however, sort of like re revised in a certain proposal of renomination was proposed to extend the site boundaries, particularly buffer zone uh, boundaries. Um, because we have all these problems of industrial things, uh, urban development, but also we have in the site, we have the, the sort of nomadic population, we have sort of the traditional people who also have their right to exist in this. So we have to somehow take these all into account in the management system. And of course, as also Ozer was saying earlier, in somehow the link between Persepolis and Mardasht area to the Pasargade area is, is a natural link. So because they were always linked, there was a water management system, we have the water, they have all these um, dam structures here and so on. So it is part of one whole land, cultural landscape which I think is important to keep in mind. Um, so the importance of the context is of great importance, and now even UNESCO is learning to appreciate this issue. Uh, so cultural landscape is defined by UNESCO as the result of human creative cultural expressions responding to the needs of the society with a particular Im importance. Uh, but I think that if we look at Iran, in my view, all Iran is a cultural landscape, or to use another expression, cultural territory. Uh, and if we look at Bam, for example, Bam, you have this fortification, the citadel here, which was partly destroyed in the earthquake in 2003. Uh, we happened to have the opportunity to visit the site just before the earthquake, and then we went out, then the earthquake came. Um, anyway, and so in 2004, uh, it was proposed that this should be put on the World Heritage List, this citadel. And, but then looking at it, and we collaborated with Dr. Adel here, uh, it was decided that actually we should expand a little bit the list. So we, we took it as a cultural landscape and we decided to expand this list, particularly around, uh, along the BAM seismic fault in order to take all the historical importance of the, of the survival with nature and so on. But of course, with the time, doing a sort of like careful mapping and archeological explorations in the whole region, realized that there are lots of citadels in this. This is actually a very important cultural landscape as a whole. And in fact, uh, there was a comprehensive management plan for the whole area, quite beyond the, uh, the World Heritage Site itself. Uh, and it includes five districts. Um, and the, we, we worked with it together with these directors of the districts and they were very, very pleased to be somehow associated with the World Heritage Area. So, the World Heritage Area is not necessarily everything, but it is like putting a finger on what is important in a particular area, so, but you have, they have to take care of the context. So the context becomes the particularly important issue. Now going to Isfahan, of course Isfahan um, has an importance because, and here by the way, again, it is this black, plan which was part of the original nomination only, uh, not the whole site and not even what it meant. Uh, but it was so clear that this is the main thing, that it was enough 
at the time. But I must say also, I'm not here saying that Iran was alone in this business. All the other sides were exactly in the same way. You only put the main thing and very often the boundaries were not at, at all uh, defined. I've seen so many sites where there's no, no boundary. Nobody knows what actually is World Heritage at that time. And, and often it is just the one main monument which was put. That is in the 1970s, but also in the 19, early, early 1980s. Then slowly, gradually, this evolution has taken the attention to larger areas. Um, what is interesting now, coming to the 2005, ECOMOS had a general assembly in China, in Xi'an, and the Chinese are very much concerned about the context of their historic urban areas. And so what happened is that there is a Xi'an declaration on the conservation of the setting of heritage structures, sites and areas. And it was decided, proposed that, and there is a long description of these issues, but just in just brief, acknowledge the contribution of the setting. So the setting actually contributes to the significance of the place. If you ignore this contribution of the state of the context, you lose part of the significance of the site itself. Uh, we have to understand, document, and interpret those settings, develop planning tools to control development and change in those places, monitor and manage these issues, and work with local and interdisciplinary and international communities to make it a reality. Uh, UNESCO recommendation then in 2011 actually broadens this even further and we are talking about so-called historic urban landscape concepts, uh, which has become now a sort of like an attractive topic for many various doctoral dissertations and, and uh, master theses and so on. Uh, the historic urban landscape is defined as the urban area understood as the result of historic layering of cultural, natural values and attributes extending beyond the notion of historic center ensemble to, read the, to include the broader urban context and its geographical setting. So we are not talking only about what is specifically protected. We are, we are looking at the whole thing and not everything must necessarily be protected, but we understand how it has grown over time. For example, these are some of the lines which define the different uh, different perimeters of historical development in Isfahan, uh, just as a matter of curiosity. Uh, but, uh, of course, historic towns are living places. Uh, UNESCO defines historic urban areas, for example, uh, classifies in different categories. One of these is historic towns which are still inhabited and which continue to develop under the various social economic cultural situations, which makes it difficult to conserve. Now, Isfahan is one of these places, which was in 1930 like this, and 2014 is like that, uh, which is a major change. Of course, if we look at it, we can see that it used to be some, some sort of garden city. We had these fantastic urban, uh, urban houses, which still exist. And of course, there have been efforts to, to, to list specific buildings and to protect them as cultural heritage. But I think the problem is how to, how to preserve it as a historic town. So we have to sort of like embroaden the issue. I, I've found this uh, exhibition from British Museum. Um, uh, there is a catalog which was organized in 1976, Isfahan City of Light. Um, and there was also an architectural review which published a special Iran issue at the same time, at the same issue. And this is an article by Sherpan Kanta Cusino, who said that if by Isfahan is meant the character of the city as portrayed in the preceding pages of this issue, the chances of survival are slim indeed. He was very pessimistic. Um, 
I must say, uh, working with conservation of cultural heritage, it's a very frustrating area to work. Starting with Hillebrand's <laughs> discussion makes me cry. And so if I was not an optimist, I should change my profession. Fortunately, I'm relatively optimistic uh, by character. So regarding coming back to these UNESCO recommendations, um, in 2003, economic very report of Isfahan, uh, there was concern about the economic development, road widening, tourists which were increasing. Uh, the city was damaged by the bombardments in the war as well, and there was a risk for fire. Um, there was also this question of this Jahannama project, which was by the municipality building a big office complex right next to the World Heritage area. In fact, also in this case, there was no buffer zone. So the administration quietly created a buffer zone so that they could then say that, sorry, you are in the buffer zone. Um, and there are many other problems. And I have uh, just mentioning the metro problems and so on, whatever, which has been discussed by UNESCO experts also in various missions um, over the time, uh, which is even damage, uh, threatening the, the bridge. Uh, um, and of course now when the, when the Masjid Jame was proposed to the World Heritage List, there was also a proposal that we should look at the central, central axis of the whole Isfahan, um, which would then make that we have, ex we have an extended protection in the central areas, not only just the World Heritage areas, but also beyond the World Heritage areas. So it's working towards the historic urban landscape concept. Um, in 2010, um, the UNESCO mission report says that there was no statement of outstanding universal value yet described for the pro property. The boundary and protective buffer zones must be re-evaluated and delineated there was no comprehensive World Heritage Conservation and Management Plan for the Maidan Imam property, nor for the historical cultural axis of Isfahan city. But there were, however, numerous conservation, restoration, revitalization, and tourism development projects by ICHHDO. So action was taken, but very often in details. I am finishing soon. Um, I already proposed I would have finished at four. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, World Heritage Decisions. So in 2013, the management plan has been done. And uh, it is necessary now to have a look at the larger strategic vision uh, to be able to, the analysis of World Heritage problems in general also indicate that again, Isfahan is not the only place in this context, we have the same problems which come out all around the world. Uh, and so we have, there are now issues which are developing new tools for conservation management. You have to identify the vulnerability, what is protected, and you have to then see what is the proper management scene. This is from a doctoral dissertation on, in Italy on Assisi. Uh, and also the FARA Convention of Europe, Council of Europe, which says that there is a need to involve everyone in the society which, which have to, to be formed into a heritage community to take care of this issue, understand what it is and how to take. And you have to integrate it in, with a capacity building strategy, uh, which is now an obligation in the World Heritage context. Uh, the World Heritage Committee has decided that the, there must be a capacity building strategy. Uh, and in 2012, uh, the 40th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention uh, in Kyoto, in Japan, the World Heritage Committee finally decided we should not forget the people. Because until that time, until now, the main attention has always been the big monument, exclusive issues, 
that people had been always excluded from this. But now the World Heritage Committee has decided that only through strengthened relationships between people and heritage based on respect for cultural and biological diversity as a whole, integrating both tangible and intangible aspects geared towards sustainable development will the future we want become attainable. Thank you very much.